You know, losing your independence, it sucks. But the Frisians discovered a big positive about being annexed during the 16th century. After being subjugated, you get access to a new market. And that means discovering the sweet, sweet joys of money. At this point, Friesland had fallen in the hands of the Habsburg dynasty. If you want a more detailed picture of how this happened, check these videos. But briefly summarized, from 1514 to about 1523, the Frisian territories were a theater in the Gelders' wars. During this war, George, I have something on my face, of Saxony, sold his Frisian possessions to Charles of Habsburg. Charles was already the lord of the Burgundian Netherlands, from now on named the Habsburg Netherlands. After winning the war, he added his Frisian properties to the rest of his Dutch possessions. Near the end of this conflict, Charles had not only become the lord of the Habsburg Netherlands, but he had also succeeded his grandfather as more or less the ruler of Spain in 1516, and succeeded his other grandfather as Archduke of Austria in 1519, along with the other Austrian possessions. Then in 1520, he was elected as Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. So before we continue, Let's take in that Friesland had been added to the largest empire that Europe had seen since Charlemagne. I mean, it ain't no Rome, but it's nothing to scoff at. This also means that from now on, whenever we do a video about Friesland, we must discuss the situation in the rest of the Netherlands for context as well. Oh, also, perhaps more important than all aforementioned topics, Charles wisely grew a beard. Like, easily top 5 of his best decisions. In 1531, Charles wanted to restructure and centralize his possessions in the Netherlands. For this, he created three councils, called the Collaterale Raden, which acted primarily in an advisory role. First was the least consequential, the Council of Finances. This council oversaw Charles' possessions in the Netherlands and enacted his financial policies. Next up is the State Council, which started off as the most important of the three. It was a political advisory council and mainly consisted of nobility. Members were appointed directly by the Lord of the Netherlands. Last but not least was the Privy Council. This council consisted of lawyers and jurists. They were a legal advisory council for the governor of the Netherlands. They had to draft the laws and ensure they were enacted by local governments. They slowly gained more power and influence and soon replaced the state council as the most prominent body within the Habsburg Netherlands. In opposition to these centralizing policies stood the regional rulers, who were keen on protecting their autonomy. The Habsburg Netherlands were subdivided in 17 provinces. Every region, or gewest in Dutch, had a stadtholder. Stadtholder has some interesting linguistic background which you can see on the screen now. But for lazy readers, it basically meant placeholder, as they ruled in Charles's name. One stadtholder of Friesland was Georg Schenk von Tautenburg. He was one of the first stadtholders and was the first stadtholder to rule over a completely subjugated Friesland. However, Groningen had by now been separated from Friesland. But in his time, he also took possession of Groningen, along with Overijsland Drenthe, in Charles's name, and was named stadtholder of each of these provinces as well. The reason I'm highlighting Schenk is because his tenure as stadtholder will touch on most topics we will discuss today. In 1548 and 49, Charles enacted two policies, which for the rest of history would tie the knot between Friesland, Groningen and the rest of the Netherlands. First, in 1548, the Netherlands, together with French Comte, were consolidated into one Kreis, the Burgundian Kreis. This Kreis was unique in the fact that it was far more autonomous than other circles. Secondly, in 1549, Charles enacted a pragmatic sanction. No, no, not that one. A pragmatic sanction. This decree determined that Charles' successor would inherit all of the Netherlands, instead of having to abide by each separate succession law of each separate territory. Speaking of Charles' heir, in 1555 Charles V decided to pull Diocletian and retired from being the most powerful man in Europe. His Spanish territories, along with her vast American colonies, were given to his son Philip II. Among other territories, the 17 provinces were also given to Philip. The rest Charles gave to his bro. The effect of these combined policies would mean that the Habsburg Netherlands were now one united autonomous area, with one liege lord, one successor, and one religion.
Oh no, wait, what's that? In the 16th century, something happened in Europe that rocked the Catholic faith. Let's see, how do I put this simply? In 1517, a monk in Wittenberg decided to nail a piece of paper to a door, and then a few million people died. That monk was Martin Luther, and on this paper were the things he thought were wrong with the Catholic Church. Mind you, he didn't want to split the Catholic faith, he merely sought reform. But split it, he did. Mostly in Northern Europe, many Protestant religions sprung up. Sometimes it was state-sponsored, and sometimes it was a grassroots movement. The first one happened in East Frisia, where Edzard the Great and his son, Anno II, converted to Lutheranism. Anno's brother Johann, who became his unofficial co-ruler, remained Catholic, however. Johann tried to reconvert his brother. But Anno remained firm in his beliefs. He secularized monasteries and started repressing Catholicism, creating a rift within East Frisian society. The second one happened in Westerlaus Friesland. But the Habsburgs were also the defenders of Catholicism. So, yeah, they disapproved of all this Reformation brabble. But the Reformation found many a convert among the Frisians. This was heavily repressed by the Stadtholder, with many brutal reprisals, especially towards Anabaptists. In 1530, a man named Wiebrand Jans was burned in Ljauert for being a heretic. He was the first Frisian martyr, but he definitely wouldn't be the last. In 1531, Sik of Freix was beheaded in the same city. He was an Anabaptist and had been rebaptized in Emden. But even more gruesome was what happened to the followers of Jan van Gelen. Van Gelen was a Hollander and a follower of Jan van Leiden from the Münster Rebellion. Van Gelen planned to commit terror attacks against Dutch Catholics. Schenk attempted to stop Van Gelen's men from preaching, but failed. Van Gelen's followers forcibly took possession of a cloister as part of his terror attacks. After a siege of eight days, Schenk retook the cloister. 39 of Van Gelen's followers were executed immediately, and all captives who didn't renounce their faith were executed. But there was one Anabaptist who stood above all this violence, one whose influence is still felt around these days. And we will talk about him in a bit. We have talked about Frisian involvement in commerce before, but until the 16th century, these exports were mainly focused on selling surpluses, which was all about the change. See, Friesland has always been a land of agriculture. With their fertile coastal land, both merchants and farmers took advantage of the local geography. But during the 16th century, Holland, and especially Amsterdam, developed itself into the commercial hub of the Low Countries. This position was only strengthened by the... Um, decline of Antwerpen in the Eighty Years' War. And this wealth spread to the surrounding area as well. And Friesland certainly got their piece of the pie, as the growing economy of Holland required fuel for heating houses, furnaces, etc. The main burning fuel during the Middle Ages was wood. But when the Hollanders had chopped away most big forests, they switched to peat. Friesland was still filled to the brim with boglands containing precious peat. The eyes of investors turned to Friesland. Each region of Friesland profited of Holland's growing economy in their own way. Most straightforward of this profiting was in the southeast, where Dutch investors dug canals to transport and brought in guest workers from Drenthe and Overijssel to dig up peat. With heavy investment in the area, these bogs eventually turned into more green arable land. At Lege Midden and the southwest profited of the transportation of this peat via their canals, issuing tolls on passing ships. In the meantime, farmers on the playgrounds started shifting from subsistence farming to commercial agriculture, as they started producing export-oriented goods like butter and cheeses. Some of the more entrepreneurial peat skippers saved up some money and bought big cargo ships. They started sailing to Norway and back, bringing with them hulls filled with firewood. This greatly benefited towns like Hilpen. There is this common perception that the great economy of the Dutch Golden Age roughly the 1580s to 1672, mostly came from the spice trade in Indonesia. But this isn't entirely true. The biggest and most stable source of Dutch wealth actually came from the Baltic Sea trade. In Dutch we call this the This translates to mother trade, in reference to its importance. The Baltic Sea trade mostly consisted of importing grain from Eastern Europe and selling it in Western Europe. This trade dated back to the Middle Ages, however. The Netherlands became Western Europe's financial center this way. 
and this increasing wealth for Holland also spilled over to Friesland, who happily participated in the Moedernegotie. On the way towards the Baltics, they filled their hulls with bricks and roof tiles from places like Haas and Makkum. On their way back, they stuck their ships with grain from Eastern Europe and wood from Scandinavia. But keep in mind that ballasting these ships with earthenware was common practice for most Dutch ships going towards the Baltics. I just wanted to mention the Frisians in particular. The Dutch had such a tight grip on this trade that over 50% of ships passing through the Sound were of Dutch origin, and they shipped 60 to 70% of the cargo going through there. Frisian farmers were mostly tenant farmers. Most of the land was owned by the church, Hadlingen, or middle class landowners. But this was par for the course in Europe. In the 1550s, the farmers realized they could improve their situation by investing in wet infrastructure, and they began constructing their own water mills. Now, water management is a big thing in the entire Netherlands, for obvious reasons. But let's bring back Stadtholder Schenk. He is the great forebear of the modern wetterskip Friesland. This is the modern day governmental body that oversees water management for Friesland. Up until this point, each Gietenij, more or less the equivalent of municipalities, took care of their own dikes and such. But this led to disputes over funding, mainly in that settlements further inland refused to pay for upkeep. This led to the great arbitration of Schenk in 1533. He laid the foundations of the Zeedijk contributies. This made it clear who was responsible for the upkeep of which dike, which would continue up until 1980. Now settlements further inland couldn't complain, as they now had their assigned dike to pay for. This was an important step towards organizing the water management that we Frisians still benefit from to this day. Before we end today's video, I want to discuss two influential Frisians from this era. One of them wielded great political influence during his life, and the other his religious ideas still hold sway in many parts of the world. And something that ties these two together is that both their views on the Reformation were heavily influenced by the disastrous Münster Rebellion of 1534, which I mentioned before and will not get into now. But if you finish this video, then check out this video to learn more. First up is the Frisian who made a great career under the Habsburgs, Wigle van Aita. He was born in 1507 in Wudem. He was raised by his uncle, Bugo van Aita. Bugo had managed to become a counselor to the High Court of Holland, basically the Supreme Court for the early modern Netherlands, and was the first Frisian to build a political career in The Hague. His little nephew, however, would soon come to overshadow this accomplishment. Wigle, better known by his Latinized name Viglius, studied law in Leuven, and went on to hold high positions in various universities throughout Western Europe. He mingled in various academic circles and held correspondence with several learned men. Most notable of these was the famous humanist Erasmus. For a long time, Figlius enjoyed his academic life, even turning down many offers of high positions in government from Charles V, most notably the offer of tutoring his heir Philip. Yet in 1542, he returned to the Low Countries to pursue a career in politics. In 1549, he managed to become the president of the Privy Council. And in 1554, he became the president of the State Council. That last one really irritated Dutch nobility. As you might recall, the State Council was mostly reserved for nobility. But Figius was merely middle class. Figius strongly opposed the reformation that swept Europe as he witnessed the confusing mess that was the Münster Rebellion. For God has spoken to me. He had also fought against Protestantism during his time as judge in the highest German court. He saw the benefits of Habsburg rule, seeing the economic prosperity that the Frisians had gained, coupled with his own meteoric rise through the Habsburg ranks. Although he was pro-Habsburg and pro-Catholicism, he wasn't shy of criticizing Philip II's rule in the Low Countries. See, he was in favor of a more restrained approach to dealing with the Reformation as he preferred words over violence. Philip's governor, or governess, Margaret of Parma was an ally of Figlius, and he had her ear. However, as the unrest in the Netherlands got out of hand, she was replaced by Fernando Alvarez de Toledo, better known as the Duke of Alba. He was nicknamed the Iron Duke, and well, you don't get a nickname like that by being sweet. Figlius and Alba quickly butted heads. Figlius greatly opposed Alba's handling of the Reformation, and even more so the extra taxes that he introduced. But more about that in the next video. Yet Figius still supported Habsburg rule. Luckily for him, however, he would never have to see the end of Habsburg rule in the Netherlands, as he died in 1577, before the Dutch revolt changed into a war of secession, 
little remains of Frigius' stint as one of the most influential figures of his time. This is mostly due to the fact that he kind of backed the wrong horse. And his dream of a Catholic Habsburg Frisia shattered. But a contemporary figure of Figius still has influence that is felt to this day. Menno Simons. Menno Simons, or Minne Simons in very Frisian, was born in 1496 in Wietmarsum. In 1525 he became a chaplain in nearby Penyum. Ever since Luther had brought forth his 95 Theses, Menno had struggled with several questions of his faith. But in the end he always remained true to his Catholic views. But when Sekefreix was executed, he bought copies of Luther's writings and studied them to learn more about several subjects of faith, primarily the practice of baptism. He found nothing that would satisfy his need for answers. When his brother, who was a follower of Van Gelen, was executed, Menno decided it was time for a new movement. Menno became a pacifist, as the violence concerning the Munster Rebellion scarred him for life, especially due to his brother's part in Van Gelen's foil plot. The followers of Menno's teachings are called Mennonites. They are an Anabaptist denomination. Menno was in favor of excommunication, but this rarely happens within Mennonite circles, only in extreme cases. As Anabaptists, they are against infant baptism, insisting that you need to be baptized as an adult. They also oppose celibate priesthood. Menno spent his life on the run after his second baptism. He wandered through Groningen and East Frisia with his wife and children. During his life, he rebaptized many new followers and ordained new priests that followed his teachings. He died in 1556. He had a huge influence on Anabaptist movements, as he finally managed to build a peaceful sect of Anabaptism. Up until then, they were often characterized by persecution and violence. Although the persecution part didn't go away just quite yet. Mennonites can still be found around the world, though his teachings are more popular outside of Europe, especially in North America and various African countries. In the 21st century, there are about 1.47 million Mennonites around the world. This makes Simons the only Dutch church reformer that found success in the long run. So, that was a fun video, wasn't it? I wonder what the next installment will be about. I mean, all these new flavors of Christianity won't have a large impact on either Frisian or Dutch history, right? Wait, wait. do you guys hear that? Oh no. Ah, be careful! Ah. Well, guys, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and the whole shebang. Have a good one, and see you all next time.